Um, I am Leslie. I am mum of three. Um, and I suppose my story starts when um, I was pregnant for the first time and everything was going really well. I was midwife led and baby was fine and you know being a first time mum had no clue what to expect and what was happening. So got to 40 weeks and five days and found out his heart had stopped. So that obviously, you know, kind of <laughs> put everything into a massive tailspin. Uh, I mean, it's just um, going in because I had, I, I'm probably going to, I'm going to stumble through this, but um, I had been, I was off on maternity leave, had spent a week kind of preparing um, meals, getting ready, you know, washing clothes, all that kind of stuff. And had spent the day cleaning the house and realized that afternoon that I hadn't really felt any movement. Called Tommy and said, um, you know, something's not right. He's like, I'll be home, you know, we'll get it. If still nothing, we'll go and get it checked. Came home, sitting and ended up going because I just knew something wasn't right. And went and we're sitting in the waiting room at the Royal, we were in the Royal, sitting in the waiting room at the Royal and, you know, surrounded by all these people coming in in labor, pregnant, and I knew, and I saw a midwife that had um, done our antenatal classes. Oh, you're here, baby's gonna be here soon. I, I knew something wasn't right. And we did get the news that night that his heart had stopped. And um, yeah, that I, I didn't even know how to process that information. Um, went home and, and that was, we were there for hours and went home knowing that, you know, that, that his heart had stopped and kind of not really knowing Tommy, you know, next day he phoned the family and they all came down and they had said, you can go for, a, you know, have your baby now. Um, that night we can bring you in for induction tomorrow or you can go home, have some time, come back the next, you know, on, that was a Monday, come back on the Wednesday. And I just, I needed, I, I didn't actually know what I needed. Um, so went home and, Went back and on the Wednesday, had some time just to kind of, I mean, what do you, what do, you do with that? Um, so came back on the Wednesday and had, he was born Wednesday night. Um, no one, and it was no one that, you know, he was not going to cry or anything, you know, whenever. But I have to say that birth was, you know, that kind of, you have a baby and you get that immediate rush of love that happened which with my other babies hasn't happened but because i was in a different spare headspace so we um we were in that so it was what is now in the royal the snowdrop room but we were in at the time it was room nine um i think that was the number on it room nine um so we were in that room it was just us we spent time with and we named him joshua so we spent time with joshua um and that and yeah in the room so just you know I think we were there for a day two days something like that I was, it's all just kind of been but we spent time with him and then um yeah and then it, we when we left we had to go through that waiting room with people leaving with their babies people coming in and labor with completely empty arms <laughs> um so you know it's kind of after that I, I you know you just kind of are dealing with one, being pregnant and all of a sudden not being pregnant again, not having a baby at home. Hormones from being pregnant, my milk came in. <laughs> they gave me a tablet to stop my milk coming in. Um, so that, yeah, that's that's essentially where it, start, <laughs> where it started. Um, I, I mean, that, that, you know, we, like, blah, 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 that's, I'm just gonna do a blah, you can, you can edit that bit <laughs> Um, so we had his family came down and stayed with us for a while um, and then they you know they were there for a number of days and then we kind of felt like we needed our own space um, and my family is here so they're all in the states and they had been planning on coming over so my mom and my sister came over you know about a week or two after but in that and you know meantime we kind of thought okay well we need to do something, you know, we'll, we'll go and we'll go away for a few days. And it was literally trying to run away from what had just happened. 
Um, and we sat at dinner the first night we were away, and there was a woman who probably was about seven months pregnant sitting beside us at dinner, and it was, you just kind of go, you can't, you can't run away, you know, you're carrying everything with you, you can't run away from it. So, um, so my mom and my sister came over, and, and I think it was really actually really hard for them not being here at the time, um, because they, you know, they, you know, kind of, they felt removed from it, and I felt like I needed support, but by the time they got here, but it was nice having my family here. It was really nice, and particularly my sister. It was really, really brilliant having her here for a few weeks. Um, but yeah, I think it was my mom just felt, she just felt like she missed out being here at the time. Um, so Tommy had to go, Tommy took a number of weeks off, had to go back to work. Um, and then I did probably what everybody in the situation does, it starts Googling everything. So I spent days on Dr. Google going, you know, you know, why did I do, why did this happen? You know, what could I have done differently? Um, and Tommy would come home and I'd go, this is what it is. This is, I know this is what it is. I know this is what it is. Um, and after about, I think it was probably, we were about five or six weeks after we had had Joshua and we went to our first sounds meeting and realized that everybody does that. <laughs> um, and it was nice to be in a room of people that just completely understood. Um, how it felt and particularly because it was people that had had completely different experiences but knew what we were feeling. Um, people that had lost their first babies, people that had lost their subsequent babies, you know, people that had older kids, but all just knew exactly. And when we went, I kind of thought this is gonna be like an AA meeting and I'm gonna to have to stand up and go, hi, my name is Leslie, and, but, but um, we didn't. We hadn't met the befriender the the person running the group beforehand before it started and he was like you can speak if you want to you don't have to speak if you don't want to um and by the end of the the two hours i had kind of shared everything and i think one it was being in a group of people that understood but um it was also being able to share most of <laughs> no, i'm okay i'll just wipe my eyes <laughs> Hopefully this can all be edited together. <laughs> uh, it was, uh, it was nice to tell the story of the birth. So I think one of the nicest things was about maybe two days after having them, a couple of friends came around the house and um, this friend of mine had had a baby the year previous. <laughs> years period I can't remember how anyway I can't remember how old her baby was but she was a mother and it was just nice to talk about the birth as the birth um because obviously that's one of the memories I have I don't have very many but that is one um and so yes it was just being around people that completely understood um and, the, and those meetings carried us through a lot of our time in those immediate months. Being the once a month mean, it was one, something to look forward to, which sounds really strange, but something to look forward to. And, um, you know, just being around people that completely got it. And you could see people that were at different stages of, you know, where they were. So they might be three years down the road or they might've gone on to have other kids or they might be in the same, you know, at the same stage as you, but it was, just nice to go right I'm not always gonna feel like this um so yeah that that really did help us through um we so uh, Josh was born in July um and I while I was sitting in that room before the induction started I knew I was gonna get pregnant again because and I like I he, we hadn't even had a baby but I knew that was, I wanted, and then obviously when it came time to even thinking about trying again, um, yeah, that was, it was not quite so easy because at the time we didn't have any postmortem results, so we had no idea why it happened. 
Um, we don't know if it could have happened again. We don't. We didn't know, you know. But we kind of thought it. It took a lot of, you know, discussion and will we do this and what happens if it happens again and. All, but we both knew that we wanted to try again, um, and so we did. Um, it did kind of take all of the fun and innocence and romanticism and anything about getting pregnant and having a baby was not there just because, you know, we didn't have our baby and we were trying again and it was um, because we wanted, it kind of felt more like, yeah, we're trying to, we're trying again for a reason. <laughs> um, I found out I was pregnant with Abigail um, on New Year's Day, which was such a lovely way to start the new year. Um, but it meant that that pregnancy, I was an absolute, you know, I, I was, I didn't know whether I was coming or going. I didn't know what to do with myself. I was in the middle of doing a master's and was spent a lot of the time writing up at home by myself while Tommy was at work. And um, so I had a lot of time to live in my head <laughs> um, and was a, a massive ball of anxiety. Um, I, having gone from being midwife led with the first pregnancy and wanting every, you know, kind of wanting to, you know, I was happy not having scans and I was happy not, I took everything going. I would have gone, lived in the hospital, <laughs> getting a scan every day if I could have, just to have that reassurance. And by that point, um, we had had the postmortem results and I had been told that it was they couldn't find a cause. There was no reason. And that was why we had, to, that was one of the things that kind of helped us decide to go ahead and try again, was that whatever the results was of the postmortem, we were gonna try anyway. So um, by the time we got the postmortem results, I was already about seven weeks pregnant. Um, and they couldn't find, you know, Whatever. There was no reason. There was no cause. It was intrauterine growth restriction, and they can't say what caused it, and they can't pinpoint whenever it, it started. So um, I was um, monitored a lot more closely, and which for me and where I was at the time was exactly what I needed. I needed appointments every two weeks. I showed up on the royal's doorstep half a dozen times through my pregnancy just because I was convinced I didn't feel any movement. I, you know, it was every little thing was, I became obsessed with movement. Um, and I have to say, Abigail never stopped moving. Um, so, but if there was a 10 minute time where she wasn't kicking, that was a, a point of panic. Um, so yeah, that was the longest, that was a long nine months. Um, and I was, because Joshua was 40 plus five days, um, I had made the decision to be induced at 39 weeks because I just knew that I wasn't gonna be able to make, because I didn't have the milestone of, oh, well, you know, he was born at 32 weeks and, you know, once I get past that, then everything's good. You know, I, I knew that it could happen at 40 weeks again. So, um, yeah, I was induced early and um, relatively straightforward. Um, we being back in the hospital was very um, difficult because I was, you know, going into rooms that I had been in before. There was a room I one time I went back for in the middle of the night for a reassurance scan and took me into the same room that I had found out that Joshua's heart had stopped. And that kind of, it just brings everything back. Um, so even just going back through those doors um, was hard. Um, so we had our own room for the entire time. Um, 
Tommy was, you know, with me the entire time through the induction. We weren't, we, you know, we had a private postnatal room, you know, when it was just protective. Um, but when she was born, she, her heart had started to, just before she was born, her heart had started to um, drop a little bit. So um, when she was born, they took her away just to make sure that everything was, and it probably was about 10 seconds. <laughs> but to me, it felt like, 30 minutes um, and when I when they when I did have her it, I didn't have that immediate rush of love so of course I all of a sudden just went you know what you know she's here now she's fine everything's healthy but I don't feel it um, so yeah that the that's whenever I think that's kind of when everything sort of hit because the so we had a healthy baby <laughs> People thought it was kind of like, oh, well, you know, you're pregnant again, everything's fine, baby's here, baby's healthy, you know, you can kind of, you know, she fills the hole. Um, and I just, the first six months of having her here was to, I mean, the only way I can describe it is black. <laughs> um, she, did, we had a really difficult breastfeeding journey, so, um, I really struggled with that, which was, she was not happy and that everything was just, I just felt like everything was compounded. Um, and again, my mom came over, stayed for a few weeks. Um, but new mom, <laughs> new difficult breastfeeding journey. <laughs> I, ju I didn't know you know, I didn't know what to do with myself. I didn't know what to do with the baby. I didn't know, um, I was trying to follow advice I, of health visitors and midwives and friends and family. And I just didn't have a, I just felt like I didn't have a clue. Um, so, I'll, I'm gonna pause. How, do, do you want me to keep going just with my story? Cause my, my story's very long. <laughs> Um, okay. Um, so I, Tommy went back to work. Tommy had a, again, a good few weeks off. Um, Tommy went back to work and I spent a lot of time, you know, feeling really alone and isolated and purposely made a point to get out to something every day. And that was just to get myself out of the house, um, to be around other people, even though I didn't feel like I wanted to be around other people. Um, but so there was, you know, one day I went to baby massage and one day I went to the breastfeeding group and one day I went to the baby group and what, you know, it was just to get out. And I spent hours walking around the park just, you know, for her to sleep and for me to get out. Um, and then he would come home from work and I'm like, here you go. I don't know what to do. I don't, you know. Um, so yeah, there was, um, a lot of feeling really isolated and feeling really alone and feeling like if Joshua was here, he wouldn't be like this. She was unhappy. I was unhappy. And it was because it wasn't him. So, um, and I felt really awful for that because she was here and she was healthy. Um, but I didn't feel any connection. Um, and I didn't know what to do with her. I didn't know how to make her happy. And I didn't know, you know, I didn't know how to feed her. I didn't know how to put her to bed. And, And then I kept telling myself, um, I was convinced that somebody was going to come and take her away, um, even though she was com here and completely healthy. Um, I became really, yeah, I was really, um, I mean, I know a lot of first time parents are kind of vigilant about, because everything's new and, you know, 
baby has a fever or baby's coughing or whatever. You kind of, I was really anxious about um, everything that she did. We spent a lot of time in a and &E or calling the doctors or, um, you know, just, and I actually, to this day, feel like I treat her a little bit more delicately than I would my, it's just because she was the first one. Um, so yeah, I spent those first five, six, seven months just feeling like I was in a black hole, not knowing what to do, not feeling any connection. Um, lots of, lots of crying, <laughs> both for me and her. <laughs> we all cried. Um, there was many a day when I used to sit in her nursery, um, just on the floor, holding her with her crying and me crying and not really knowing what to do. She didn't sleep very well. Um, so needless to say, nobody was sleeping very well. Um, so it wasn't until, and I think, you know, and a lot of it, I know now, I know a lot of it came from, you know, I was still dealing with, you know, I was pregnant and had a baby within a, you know, just over a year after having Joshua. So I know I was dealing with grief. I was dealing with, you know, everything. Um, and it wasn't until I had gone, she was about four months maybe. Um, and I went out to dinner with a couple of friends of mine and was kind of, you know, regaling them with stories of lack of sleep and feeding problems and whatever else you do is, and they were like, but, you know, they didn't have their own kids at the time, but yeah, are you, in, you're enjoying it? And I was like, no. Nope. And that was, I think that was actually the first time that I said, I hate this, I really hate this. Um, and from that point, it just was like, I'm supposed to love this. You're a parent, your kids are here. You know, you're supposed to absolutely love being a parent. It's all lovely and it's all rosy and, you know, babies are wonderful and all this kind of, and I didn't. Um, and I don't actually think I've really, I, I don't think that Tommy actually knows a lot of this. So um, this will be interesting for him to see. Um, and it took me, pardon me, let me, I'm just gonna take a break to <laughs> wipe my face. <laughs> Um, oh, God. I know once I start talking, it's just like... No, you're just right. And I don't even know... Oh, it's not coherent, but anyway. It is Jumping all over the show. Oh. So, yeah, from that point, it kind of really hit home that it, something wasn't right. Um, I wasn't, I wasn't enjoying it. And when it's only when I can look back and go, yeah, that, and that's why it's all just black. Um, but, and that's, it's just the color of it. Uh, that's, and the, the way I can describe it is that that's how I was feeling at the time. Um, and I, it took, after that, it took me probably, I don't know, three or four months to even admit that or you know accept admit that yes that's really what I was feeling and accept that something needed to change um yeah because I I was it was that kind of how I am is affecting her and you know that I but I couldn't help how I was feeling. And that was, you know, I was in that situation where how I was feeling was affecting her, but I couldn't do anything about how I was feeling. And that was affecting her. And then that was just perpetuating that cycle. Um, so through fans groups, and I have to say, I was quite lucky to um, have the support of the clinical psychologist and the, because I was in the Royal and the Royal has the, has the services. Um, I was quite lucky that after I had Joshua, um, I was referred to the clinical psychologist who supported me all the way through losing Joshua and my pregnancy and the first probably six or seven, maybe even longer than that. I can't remember when I was discharged, but the first, most of Abigail's first year. Um, so with her support and um, SANS groups, you know, being able to go 
and say in a sounds group to people that have gone on to have other babies um, how it was failing and how much I hated it and you know, the fact that I'm blaming her for him not being here but if he was here then she wouldn't be here it it took a number of months of lots of you know talking to everybody um, for me to be able to go and speak to my GP um, who I did have a really good relationship with um, and I started on medication which did help level things off um, and kind of helped me to when I felt more level, I was able to see things differently. And as Abigail grew and became her own, I sort of was able to separate her from Joshua. And they're, you know, obviously they're not the same people. I can't, I always, he in my head is still, this is what, 11 years, almost 12 years ago this that he um it was 2009 so you know it's been um a long a long it's been a number of years but in my head he's a baby i i know a lot of parents that lose kids see the milestones um of other children that are kind of going starting school and starting nursery and you know this is what my child would be doing at the time in my head he's always been a baby and has never really changed so um Abigail kind of started to grow and develop and that was, she became her own person. So things just seemed to, the, the feeding kind of eased and everything seemed to ease. And um, yeah, it wasn't so black anymore. Um, no, not to say that there weren't difficult times, but I did feel that um, I f it took a number of, I don't know, probably a year to feel like I was enjoying it and we did have a connection but it's you know as a new parent you kind of expect that's that's that immediate connection as people don't tell you that it can grow and so that started to grow and you know our relationship is developed and she was getting older and you know it, it felt um, I did feel like I was starting to come out of whatever the the blackness was um, until we went, decided that we were going to have another one, um, and Tommy was happy. We have, we had one, let's not have any more, but I was, we always, I always knew that I wanted to have two, and although we did have two, we didn't have two here, and having Joshua, there's a hole, and I could have had, I now realize that I could have had 15 kids, and it still wouldn't have filled that hole, but yeah, I wanted to be pregnant again and have another baby. So took a, you know, a couple of years to get to that point. But um, when I was pregnant, um, I found out I was pregnant with Maya. It didn't happen quite so quickly this time, which again was another kind of um, why did it? Why is it taking time? What's going to happen? Are we? Is this ever? You know. um, got pregnant again, and that pregnancy was just as anxiety filled as the. The previous one. Um, when I went to my booking and appointment, the midwife had said, "Last, you know, Abigail was healthy. Everything, pregnancy was fine. Everything was fine. You can, you know, you're you're considered low risk at the time. In my head, I was high risk because it was it could happen again. Um, statistics are low, but I was one of those statistics, so it could happen again." So again, I was, I, I took everything going, all the tests, all the, you know, um, all the reassurance scans, everything. Um, and again, you know, healthy pregnancy. Um, and Maya induced 39 weeks. That, there was a point, she, she was a smaller baby. So she, um, on, you know, on the growth chart, was plotting a little bit lower. And halfway through my pregnancy, I was seen by not my normal consultant who made a comment about um, her being a little bit small. And the way he phrased it was exactly the same thing as the doctor who had told us that Joshua's heart had stopped had phrased the fact that he was small. 
and that ja again. And, and it was one of those things that, you know, um, brought everything back. So I left that appointment. Just actually could have walked out of the appointment and walked back into the hospital for another scan because she was small and something was going to go wrong. Um, so it just, it, all those little things just bring it back. Um, so induced 39 weeks again because she, her growth had stopped. Her growth had slowed. So I was like, right, that's uh, not going down. So um, again, straightforward induction. Um, and she was here, she was healthy. And pregnancy was anxious. Not as anxious as the first time, but anxious. Um, when I got home, I, it, it felt a little bit different. I felt because I had Abigail here, I, I kind of sort of felt like I knew what I was doing. Um, and Maya was a different baby, so it felt easier. Um, and maybe all of that together kind of, um, you know, helped things feel a lot easier at the time. Um, and I see the two of the girls as being like that. I would be slightly more protective of, I don't know if they anybody notices this except for me, but slightly more protective of Abigail than I would be of Maya because she's, she's robust and she's boisterous and she's bouncy and she's fine, you know. Whereas Abigail, it's like, ooh, you know, watch out, be careful. And I, it probably is just because, you know, of how I felt at the time. So um, if it wasn't for Joshua, neither one of them would be here. Um, and, you know, I have two healthy, healthy girls here who are, all, Maya's almost eight and Abigail is ten and a half going on 16 <laughs> so um and they are you know they're they're happy and healthy and complete characters um but there isn't a day that goes by that i don't think about you know the, the one who isn't here and kind of you know he is a part of our family it as time goes on obviously people move on um and sort of, you know, as the years go on and birthdays um, go on and, you know, the first year, everybody remembers. The second year, fewer people remember. The third year, you know, and it is, we know, but it is, I have to say, it is lovely when somebody just kind of remembers on his birthday, you know, that he was still, he's still part of our family, so. So there you go. So I'm a mom of three. <laughs> and it is hard to say that to some, uh, I gauge it based on who I'm talking to. Because otherwise people will get this if they say, oh, well, how many kids do you have? And I say three and how old are they? And then I, <laughs> you know, so, um, so yeah, that's, that's my story. I could probably count that on one hand, maybe that whole story. I've told Joshua's birth story. I mean, I would tell everybody in that first year, I would have told anybody I talked to, look at me, I've, you know, you get to Mother's Day and everybody's like, oh, well, you know, you're, because I was pregnant at the time. Oh, your first Mother's Day, neck, you know, kind of your pre, <laughs> so I, I would have quite happily told my birth story to anybody. Um, whole story from start to finish. And I, I mean, that that's not even like all, all of yeah. it, yeah. <laughs> but that probably, I don't know, half a dozen times, maybe. <laughs> um, I didn't expect this <laughs> because it is like, you know, when you tell it, because I've lived it and told bits of it so many times, I can quite easily talk about it and not, and feel like, you know, it just, it's just happened and that's, that's it and not cry or what. And yeah, just sometimes it's, and I think it is thinking about um, how it was, and it was at that intense period after Abigail was here, thinking about that and sort of not that, knowing that, you know, there are parts of it that probably Tommy doesn't even know um, how bad it was. Um, 
because I haven't really, I don't know if I've actually even really admitted it to some myself, other, you know, I don't, I've never really spoken some of the things out loud. Um, so yeah, just even thinking like, you know, those bits of it, you know, when you're, oh yeah. Um, so yeah, this, you don't have to put this bit in, but just, I, I think, I just feel like I need to say to somebody uh, that, you know, when I spent ages walking around the park and you get that kind of, I'm pushing the pram. What happens if I just let the pram go down the hill? Um, that kind of thing. I know I've never told Tommy that. And, you know, kind of sitting in her room going, <laughs> you know, like physically like you know I would have said I never self-harm because I didn't cut I didn't but I can't take that how many times I would have just like beat myself around the head so and yeah that I never shared that and it kind of felt like I don't I never really wanted to admit it but um yeah it was yeah just thinking that period all the rest of it, I kind of go, yeah, it was fine. New mom, all that, that six to eight months after she was, when she was here, it was like, I could have quite easily just, somebody could have taken her and that would have been fine. So, so yeah. Tommy is a, has been massively supportive. Um, but yeah, there, it's still even admitted it to myself and to him and yeah, cause you don't want to talk about it because dear goodness, People will take the baby off you and what is wrong with you? But yeah, I could have, you know, let the pram go, roll down the hill into the street. So, um, yeah, and yes, uh, you know, people probably think those things more often than they would admit. And I know, I mean, like, I know you, you can completely understand. <laughs> so um, that's why I feel like I could say it. <laughs> and I probably could say it too loads of other people and they would completely understand it because I mean I would joke now like I would put my two girls on the corner and put a sign like you know free to a good home if you want to take them like I would joke about that now and I'm sure lots of other parents would joke about that as well but you know that's kind of like ha 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 they're doing my head in um but yeah that that kind of like really serious I would never have really wanted to harm her but yeah, at the time. And so that's obviously, I know that's why a lot of it's looking back at it. You know, I can see that, you know, 11 years ago, I have to count like, what, what year are we in now? But how many, how many years on our, but looking back over the years and having, you know, connections to pangs and science and talking to loads of other people that, um, you know, how I, I was taking everything out, you know, how I was feeling is normal and or not not normal but <laughs> yes tip common um so and i was you know was never gonna harm her but was quite happy to just go get yourself together you know like so um or put her in the cot and then go into another room and just have a big loud scream i'm pretty sure our neighbor just thought like what is going on in there the abigail was probably about two months old and Tommy and I don't really argue or fight or, you know, I'd have a heated discussion, but we don't ever, I, we never shout at each other. Three o'clock in the morning, she wanted to be fed. I couldn't feed her again because it just wasn't working. And she was screaming her head off and he was shouting at me and I was shouting at him. And I was like, I'm not, I'm not feeding her. And he's like, what do you want to do? Do you want her to die? Just like Joshua did, you know, it's like, and we like seriously screaming rails at each other about, you know, the lack of sleep, feeding a baby and not having Joshua here. And, you know, we were shouting at each other about, so, so there you go. I'm going to wipe my eyes again. And then one day I'll stop. You're, you, you might just have to say, stop talking and leave the room because <laughs> I have a home to go to. Oh, having access to the specialist support, um, that was, essentially it was a lifesaver. 
Um, and I do feel the fact that we were in the Royal and in the Belfast Trust where the support was. Um, I feel quite lucky that I was able to access that because um, I know that not everybody does. Um, but yeah, the support that, I mean, I was on a weekly basis able to go and see somebody and talk through things. Um, she would have spent time with both Tommy and myself at the start. And then when I became pregnant again, you know, I continued to see her at least once a month. Um, and it really, yeah, it really did help work through a lot of things that were happening and a lot of the anxieties that were coming up because of what had happened with Joshua. And yeah, having somebody to go and speak to. Um, so it was, it was massive. For maternity services um, and caring for parents that have experienced baby loss, um, I, that is one thing that we have always said is that the care that we got was outstanding. You know, we were supported um, to, particularly when we had Joshua, I mean, you know, we were supported to spend the time with him. We were supported to, you know, it was, it was a, a birth. I mean, it was, and I can only imagine what it's like to be, a, a, you know, a health professional working with a family that has lost a baby. So I can imagine that it wasn't easy for them as well, but they treated us like parents. They treated us like this was our, you know, baby. And when he was born, he looked just like dad. And, you know, it's like, it was, it was like, you know, anybody having an, a, a baby. Um, but we were treated, the care that we got was really, really outstanding. Um, so, I mean, compassionate care. I, I, I do think that all maternity staff should be trained in bereavement care, specific bereavement care, um, because parents that have experienced loss, whether they find out beforehand or they lose their, you know, they know that they're gonna, you know, their baby's heart had stopped before birth. Um, they, they, yeah, they need that specific training um and but the parents are still parents so you know the baby is still their baby and still you know kind of you know respect them as a family um and i know now that most that all of the trusts now would have a specific bereavement midwife so um and that at the time whenever we had joshua there that that position wasn't there um but that that midwife is, is um, and I know the, the Belfast Trust midwife is amazing. <laughs> so, um, but it is supporting those families when they need that support through, I mean, after losing their baby and then going on to have another pregnancy. I, um, that's something I feel really passionate about is rainbow pregnancies. Women that have had, or families that have lost their baby and they're going through another pregnancy need additional support because it isn't like the, I mean, you're, you're pregnant and you know, it's the normal appointments and checkups and making sure that everything physically is fine and all, but there's a lot of um, anxiety that goes along with it and they need that additional support. Um, I would, I have to say, I would love to see a rainbow clinic in every hospital or every trust because then um, it would be a, a separate clinic where parents that have experienced loss can go and have the additional support that they need. So consultant, midwife, you know, mental health professional, um, have that extra support away from kind of the, the standard antenatal clinic because I, I remember the number of hours I would have spent in the antenatal clinic um, surrounded by people that you know and they might have their own story obviously you don't know everybody's story but feeling not wanting to speak to anybody not wanting to look at anybody just because you know I was in my head um, it is a different it is a completely different experience thinking about how I was being pregnant with Joshua and how it was being pregnant with Abigail completely needs additional needs additional support. Um, compassionate care, 
treat, you know, kind of treat them like a family, any, any other family that's having a baby. And um, a big thing is um, read the notes before doing an appointment because um, I had to retell my story a number, a number of times. If I was saying, if I didn't happen to see the, my consultant, I saw the same consultant through both pregnancies after. Um, and if I didn't happen to see the consultant and I saw somebody that I hadn't seen before, um, I would normally, is this baby number one? No, then you have to, so retelling your story every time you go into an appointment, particularly if your care is as disjointed as some of the care can be, um, is difficult. So read the, read the notes, <laughs> it would be a big one. <laughs> Just make sure that you know what their history is and you know, that they have had a baby previously. Um, if I was to talk to anybody that has been through what I've been through, um, having a baby, particularly having a baby after um, losing, so having a rainbow baby, um, if you feel like you're struggling, reach out, talk to somebody. Um, it took me some time to do that, but you know whether that is to your partner, to your family, to your best friend, so I have to say another, so we saw the um, specialist mental health professional, but SANS was another absolute lifeline for us. So that support, we have met some amazing people through SANS who have been there and done that. So everybody, I mean, it's, you know, kind of surrounding yourself with people that have that same experience and just reaching out and knowing that you're not alone um what you're feeling like i go into a sounds meeting i could have said this is what happened this is how i'm feeling blah 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 and everybody oh yeah that that's that's what i did that's what i felt you know so knowing that you're not alone and that everybody generally is experiencing it at some point in some way um if you're yeah if you're really struggling um reach out to somebody um, and it might be that that person that's closest to you realizes that something's not right before you do um, but yeah talk if you can talk if you can um, find somebody to share it with I guess it's, know that you're not alone know that you're not alone I have to say that um, it's that was, maybe I'd put this in as um, for the health professionals as well. You can, you can edit this bit out as well. Um, I had a real, um, I didn't have a real connection with my health visitor. So kind of coming back to the, um, the health professionals, not only do maternity staff and, and then, you know, special services need to be there. Um, women having a rainbow pregnancy need additional support. I, I believe not only do, does maternity staff should all be trained in bereavement care, health visitors really need to be trained in that as well. Um, and I, I'm not actually sure what kind of training they get. Um, I know the trusts are for the, the staff in the hospitals kind of um, bring in training for the staff. But I didn't have a connection with my health visitor at all and felt like whenever she was coming for a visit, the, you know, she asked the mental health questions and it felt just like a tick box. You know, how are you doing? Da, 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 you know, kind of tick, 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 tick. And if I had, you know, this was a couple of months into having Abigail, if I had felt that connection, felt comfortable enough to open up, um, I would have, and it would have happened a lot. Probably I would have gotten help a lot quicker but um, I just didn't, she was the last person I was gonna open up to. So um, yeah, kind of have that train. But um, yeah, if you're going through, going through this kind of reach out, know that the support is there and there are um, unfortunately people that have walked that path before you that can provide that support. So, so. oh, what does life look like for me now? Um, uh, slightly overwhelming at times. 
I, um, I do, over the last number of years, have had my ups and downs. So, um, I, I do, I, I'm, I, before having babies, would normally be a person that would have kind of struggled with mental health and anxieties and, um, you know, kind of replay everything in my head. That's, that's what I do is just kind of that, um, catastrophizing, you know? Um, so, uh, yeah, it is up and down. Um, and I talk to my GP and come off medication and talk to my GP, go on medication. That has helped, um, kind of level things off whenever it needs to be, you know, kind of brought back down to a level. Um, I, yeah, I, life looks, if I step outside of it and look at it as a, um, from a, a different perspective, life is good, you know, I've, the kids are great. I do a job that I love. Um, I'm involved with loads of fantastic volunteering, you know, charity work. Um, I still am involved with SANS and, you know, run a rainbow pregnancy, next pregnancy group. Um, I, yeah, so objectively, life is, life looks good. Subjectively, sometimes it's more of, I don't take enough time for self-care. <laughs> so um, it's just knowing when my, when I'm taking a dip and getting on top of that. So generally life is, generally life is good. <laughs> I don't know, it feels weird saying that. <laughs> generally life is good. Um, but yeah, it still, it still has its ups and downs. So.